Hey again, this is the third video. This is the last of the series on science objectives. Um, we're gonna talk about the subsurface of Venus and then we're gonna finish up with some uh, discussion about instruments, um, temperature, um, instruments, magnetic field instruments, stuff like that. Um, now, uh, we'll just jump right in. Now, the, uh, like we talked about in the very beginning in the first video of the introduction, not much is known about the subsurface of Venus because the surface is so terrible, basically. Um, in order to determine uh, what the, the internal structure of a planet looks like, you have to be able to survive on the surface of that planet, which is tough to do on Venus. Um, so the internal structure of the planet, um, usually on Earth and most planets, we use quakes to determine internal structure. Uh, we, um, but, uh, Essentially, you measure vibrations is what you're doing. And these vibrations is, um, well, there's a slide that explains it in just a minute, but there's, you know, so, so when an earthquake happens, it sends vibrations through the entire planet. And those vibrations are felt near the quake and then on the other side of the planet from the quake. And how those vibrations, how long it takes them, how they've changed, how intense they are, excuse me, sorry, that tells us something about the uh, internal structure of that planet. Now, plate tectonics wise, again, scientists believe that Venus is just one big plate and therefore there are no plate tectonics on Venus. So uh, that's just there to remind you of that. Um, so how do seismic waves image the planet? Like I was saying, um, uh, you can, got, yeah, well, y'all you, can read these slides on your own and you can ask questions if you want, but I'm gonna go skip to this, this image here. So basically, uh, if there's a quake, this is Earth, by the way. If there's a quake on um, anywhere on Earth, in the surface, subsurface, or wherever, we've got seismometers all over our planet, just because we live here, we can do that, right? And so we've got seismometers all over the planet. So these, when, when the quake happens, it sends waves all throughout the planet. You know, it's, it's, and it's three-dimensional. This is flat, so you can't really see, but it sends it out, it sends it out three-dimensionally from, you know, from the planet, it's, or, or from the quake itself. And we've got seismometers around the planet in the three-dimensional, outside the board, you know, outside the, the TV and everything. So these seismometers pick up these waves. They sense these waves. They sense the timing of the waves. That's the first thing they sense. They also sense the types of waves. There's P waves uh, and S waves. Uh, P is pressure, or sorry, compressional waves, pressure waves, and then S is shear waves. And so um, it determines if it's a P wave or an S wave because um, shear waves can't can't flow through a liquid so if there's a liquid core then you're going to have a gap of um, there won't be any shear waves on the other side of that right so basically as these waves move through the planet they change and the intensity changes the 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 uh, frequency changes the 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 amplitude changes and uh, then they're sensed over here and scientists with enough of these sensors around the planet, they can put together a three-dimensional image of what the internal structure of a planet looks like. You know, how do we know what Earth looks like on the inside? We've never been very deep on Earth. We've never actually been really in, in the mantle at all. Even the deepest oil, you know, derricks and stuff don't go that deep, really. And so how do we know what the internal structure of the Earth looks like? It's through earthquakes. We have a bunch of seismometers all over the planet, and the earthquakes help us get an image of Earth. And that's how they work. If you, if you want to know more about this, let us know. This is actually a tough experiment to do on Venus because we have to wait for a quake to happen. And because you have to have a network of probes that are, that are strewn about the planet. Um, that's what makes it difficult. Uh, Venus, it's extremely difficult because of the harsh environment and because you have to have these probes all over the planet. Um, this is another image of that again here. There's an earthquake here. You have P and S waves. You have P waves that go through this, the, uh, this liquid core area, and there's no S waves here. So you know that, so scientists know, oh, hey, there's gotta be a liquid core in there somewhere because there's no S waves on the other side of it, but there's P waves all over it. So, and they can determine how big the core is by the angles and stuff like that. So you guys can see how this works, right? Again, it takes a lot of probes and it takes a lot of time. Um, so uh, seismometers, basically, you guys have seen uh, old school seismometers. This is kind of an old school seismometer. You have a it's, a, it's a dampened mass spring system. You know, you got a big roll of paper and there's a spring mass and, and the paper moves and the spring 
it, it's dampened so it doesn't move as much and then it writes on this big piece of paper you guys have seen those old school now it's all digital so there's still a there, there, there's still a spring mass system but everything's digitized and and, um, and shrunk down and smaller and they have them in all three dimensions all three axes x y and z so that no matter which way the the, the shaking occurs um, they know uh, you, I mean this is just a one axis a single axis it goes up and down if it goes left and right you really can't tell right but they've got all three axes seismometers and stuff like that nowadays so you don't have to worry about that um, the spring is optimized for frequencies and stuff like that so um, an accelerometer is what we uh, seismometers are nice scientists like seismometers but they're typically large and they're typically not very robust um, and they're typically single axis to be honest with you so accelerometers like I said in the earlier video accelerometers uh, especially in the last 10 five five ten years have come a long way and it's because of smartphones because of smartphone technology the accelerometers have come a long way because they have accelerometers in your smartphone so you can play you know uh, speed racer or whatever um, I don't know candy crush it doesn't really require an accelerometer but anyway um, so uh, accelerometers are very similar to seismometers um, but some scientists would disagree with me on that however from an engineering standpoint if it accomplishes the science goal I'm fine with it and if it's smaller and takes less power and requires less mass I'm even better with it um, and most accelerometers will do that for you uh, measures uh, accelerometer as the name would suggest it measures accelerations and um, just to give everyone a tip um, that's watching this video probably every single one of you will have an accelerometer on board your payload for one reason or another okay so just listen up um, it behaves as a dampened spring mass system just like a just like a seismometer um, they're the commercial devices they're piezoelectric piezoresistive and capacitive components this is the three-dimensional image of what they look like they're very small they're almost chip size computer chip size um, the uh, relative position can be calculated integrated from acceleration data this is why this this relationship right here is why most of us most of you will use it even if you're not determining internal structure of the planet of Venus um, you're going to want to know where your measurements are taken if you're if you're measuring uh, if you're looking for life and you discover life on Venus you're like I discovered life on Venus sweet where is it I have no idea because I took a measurement and I had no idea where I took the measurement that's not good right or you can't take a temperature measure in this measurement and say it is 10 degrees outside well, well where uh, on Venus it's 10 degrees somewhere on Venus that does us no good whatsoever however uh, an accelerometer can help you with that now on earth typically we uh, determine position through GPS right uh, there's GPS on our phones GPS on our cars GPS everywhere what you don't know about GPS or what some of you may know about GPS I don't know is that it requires a network of satellites lots and lots of satellites overhead we don't have lots and lots of satellites at Venus unfortunately we have one right now called Venus Express and it's not a GPS satellite there might be one or two others but there are GPS satellites at Venus to determine our position so um, how do we determine posi uh, position spacecraft can determine position through really uh, large and um, they have large internal sensors called IMUs inter internal um, sorry inertial measurement unit IMU inertial measurement unit what it does it's basically it measures its motion um, in three-dimensional space it, me it measures its, its inertia in three-dimensional space it knows how it's moving in 3d space spacecraft also have star trackers on board they have at least two of them and they're 90 degrees from each other and the star trackers are just as ju just as the name would suggest it is a camera that looks up at space and it looks at star patterns and this camera goes okay I think I'm looking at this this camera goes I think I'm looking at this and they match them up with their star library and this camera thinks okay I'm looking in this direction this camera goes I'm looking in this direction and the computer uh, takes the two of them and, and resolves it and says yes the spacecraft is facing this direction so the combination of the star trackers and the IMU on board a spacecraft the spacecraft can tell you where it is in three-dimensional space and which which way wh you know what is what its attitude is not you know not 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 attitude like you know ha 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 but attitude you know if it's facing up or down or left or right or what is at its attitude in three-dimensional space a spacecraft can tell you that through the combination of the star trackers and the uh, the inertial measurement unit so a spacecraft can be considered a known location 
for you guys. You guys and this is important. You guys, the, your, your payload needs a known location to start from because once you have a known location, you can measure an excel. You can use an accelerometer to measure accelerations from a known location. For example, if I took my my phone and I turned on the accelerometer to record the data, I could toss it from over there to you know no one's in the corner. I'm by myself right now. But I could toss it over there, and someone else could grab it and toss it over there, and blah blah blah. And then we could stop it, and then we could backtrack from all the acceleration data, and you could say, okay, I can't tell you that this happened in Huntsville, Alabama. However, I can tell you that where the phone started from where it ended up based on the accelerometer data. You can integrate basically because there's a relationship between acceleration, velocity, and position. So you can integrate this accelerometer data numerically, numerically integrate twice actually, and um, you can get position, relative position, only relative position. But if you have a known fixed location, so if I turned on the GPS on the phone and said record this one position and then turned off the GPS and then started throwing and using the accelerometer data, then I could also, you could throw the phone around Huntsville and we could determine where it ended up in Huntsville or even over North Alabama, you could determine, oh, it ended up over in Southern Tennessee somewhere. That phone had a crazy night, right? So um, you can use accelerometer data if you have a known location, and for you guys, the spacecraft is a known location. The spacecraft or the balloon or the lander, they will know where they are in three-dimensional space. Um, that is your known location. So um, each of you are going to have an accelerometer on board, basically, is what I'm saying. Um, uh, because if you take a measurement, you want to know where the measurement is. It doesn't do us a bit of good to say, I measured carbon, or I measured, I found a life form without knowing where it was, or I measured the temperature is five degrees. Well, where? Um, I don't know. Um, I wasn't taking that data. So it does us no good. So you have to measure, you have to have positional data in order to determine, to, to, to give your measurement meaning. Is that, that, does that make sense? Okay, great, we'll move forward. I beat that dead horse. Um, so issues with internal structure, especially on Venus, uh, number one, like I said, you have to have a network. You have to have at least three sensors to measure internal structure, which already makes it difficult. Um, and the depth, the, uh, you want the sensors to be far apart. As a general rule of thumb, the distance they are apart is the distance you can see deep. So if, so if, the, if, the, if the probes are 50 meters apart, you can see 50 meters deep, which isn't that far. So you want them to be like half a planet apart, which makes it difficult for communication and for timing and stuff like that. And then for survival. Just to drop one probe and then go half planet away, drop another probe. The first probe is dead on Venus, typically, because Venus is so harsh. Um, impact resistance. Uh, they're hitting the ground. On Venus, it won't be such of an issue because you're going to be slowed down by the thick atmosphere along the way down. Um, again, three-dimensional axis. Um, distance, if, you, if you deploy from the lander, you want to be away from the lander because landers are noisy. They pop and they crackle and they moan. It's, um, and this seismometer is listening, or this accelerometer, whatever you're using, is going to be listening for vibrations and pops and crackles and moans, even if it's just thermal pops of the lander itself, are noisy. The lander hears those. Um, we have some landers on the moon right now, and we have some seismometers on the moon, and the seismometers are not very far away from the, from the, um, from, you know, from the moon landers. And every time the sun comes up on the moon, the lander heats up. Pop, 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 pop and then gets hot, and then when the sun goes down, cools down, and the lander goes pop, 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 pop. And so the scientists, it drives them crazy. They figured out how to, how to filter out the noises from the lander and stuff, but it drives them crazy that it's so close to the lander. I've talked to these guys, and they, it, it drives them, and they could pull their hair out. They're like, if I could just go up there and move it away, move it further away, we could get much better data, because the lander's constantly creating vibrations that are felt in the ground, that are sensed by the seismometer or the accelerometer, because it's just vibrations. That's, that's what they're looking for. Moonquakes is what they're looking for on the moon, obviously. Not earthquakes, because it's not the earth. Um, power communications, how long do you operate? Those are all issues. Venus is, the, the, the main issue with Venus is the environment. It's just, it's a harsh environment on the surface of Venus. Um, a seismic network, there's a couple of ways to do it. You can either penetrate and go into the surface, and then you're kind of like, you're, if this is the surface, you've got to have something that goes down in, you know, actually, buries itself into the surface, or you can have something that lands on top of the surface and just sits on the surface, right? There's two different ways. There's positives and negatives to each. Um, it's, you know, it's tough to get into the surface. You need kinetic energy to do that. And it's tough on Venus because of the high drag, because of the atmosphere. 
But then if you're sitting on the surface of Venus, then you're susceptible to winds, you're susceptible to the atmosphere, that type thing. So you can read this chart, um, but those are, there's pros and cons, there's positive and negatives to each of those, to each way of setting up a network um, if, if you choose to do this. Um, again, this is just a, a, very, a very great artist rendering of um, how to set up a seismic network. Penetrating the surface, basically you'd have a penetrator that would go down and hit the, hit the ground and, and dig, excuse me, dig a hole, basically kind of like you're just boom, throwing it into the ground and it you know, sticks in the ground basically and it buries itself. And then uh, remaining on the surface of and just boing, boing, and then lands finally in a certain location. Um, you're going to have much higher G load on this one as well. G loads are like, you know, it hits the ground and goes boom. So um, if you want your stuff to survive, you've got to have high G equipment that can survive that. This is going to be much lower G load. However, you're susceptible to the atmosphere and you're also susceptible to winds and stuff moving around animals like forest creatures. I don't know, whatever. So, um, there's pros and cons. You can, you can look at those um, and research that. So temperature and heat flow. Temperature is going to be a big thing you measure on Venus because it's so hot, right? And so um, heat flow is something we'll talk about uh, during this presentation. But um, temperature is one of the main reasons we're, we're talking about this. So temperature versus heat flow. A temperature measurement, the objective is to understand the environment. Temperature, you know, what is the temperature of the room, basically? Typically, um, uh, you think of temperature as a point measurement, right? And you can set up a temperature network and you can measure a bunch of points. So like if you were to measure the temperature of this room, you would just put a bunch of temperature measurements all about this room, right? Now heat flow is a very detailed measurement on the depth of the temperature as you, if, if you were to go into the surface of the planet. So, so it's not just a topical temperature on the top, on the surface of the planet, but you want to go surface and then deep. That's heat flow. How does the temperature change as you go into the surface of the planet? That's very interesting stuff. You guys, you know, you know, y'all know that uh, uh, caves on Earth are like what, 65 degrees or 60, something like that. Some, you know, some sort of constant temperature. So it's the same way on the Moon. Most planets, when you when you go deep enough, they have a constant temperature. Does Venus? Does this happen on Venus? And so, how deep would you have to go to get to the constant temperature? Temperature. What is that constant temperature? So that's what that's what a heat flow measurement would be is how you take one specific location and you, you see how the temperature changes as you go with depth. Um, and, and you can already see the difficulties in that. Um, temperature network, there is some, you, you can't see the scale, but you can look at the charts on your own. There's some temperature variation across the, the surface of Venus. It's, it's typically isothermal, but there are some hot spots. Scientists don't know what the hot spots are about. They've just measured them. They don't know why there's hot spots or, or what's causing them but they, they um, have measured them. Uh, there's, not much of a difference, there's not much of a difference in the hotspots, but they do exist, and that's kind of fascinating to scientists. And so are the poles versus the equators, are they hotter? What are the causes of the hotspots? And what are the actual temperatures on the surface of Venus? We've only sent down a few probes, uh, you know, the, the, the Russian Venera missions, and those were old. And so most, and all the other measurements since then have been remote. So how accurate are those measurements? How, um, are, you know, if, if, if you were to take, if you were to take a, 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 a location that the scientists say, okay, we know the temperature in this area, you can actually measure it, be in that area and measure those temperatures and see how accurate, see how accurate this, the uh, scientists were with their remote measurements. That'd be interesting, actually. Um, temperature network, the probes are on the surface, the network of the probes implies they need to be dispersed. You want to have more, you know, the, the further apart the better and the more the better. That gives you a, a wider network and a more precise and more densely populated network. Um, this implies that uh, some will have to fall from an altitude. Um, you can have, if, if, say if you have your temperature probes come off of the lander, you can only get so far away from a lander, right? You can get shot out from a lander. We'll talk about how you get shot out from a lander. You can use, actually use CO2, or sorry, use helium that the lander has on board, um, or all of the spacecraft have helium on, have helium on board. We'll talk about that um, later. But uh, you can use that to be shot off of the lander, but you only go so far from, away from the lander. So if you wanted to get a wide network, you'd have to be uh, dropped from the balloon or from the orbiter. Um, and that's, that involves some differences there. Um, and then the, final, and the positioning becomes an issue at that point. How, you know, how precise can, is your sim, sim, how, how precise is your grid? How precise is your network? Um, and then do, how well do you know your location? Um, Heat flow, again, heat flow is temperature at one location, 
But how does the temperature change with depth? Um, this is an artist rendition of the surface of Venus. Um, does the temperature ever level off? And then how deep do you have to go till it levels off? On the surface of the moon, it doesn't, it's like a, it's maybe a half meter or so, and the temperature kind of levels off. It's kind of funny. And so uh, um, Earth is, um, I don't think the Earth is a half meter, but it doesn't take much Earth, doesn't take much depth for you to find a constant temperature on Earth too. So um, does this exist on uh, Venus? Thing you gotta watch out for is, you know, you gotta dig that. You gotta, you know, you gotta somehow make that hole, basically, make that profile. And you gotta have your temperature probe spaced out evenly, prob preferably evenly, so that you can measure the temperature. Um, heat flow, the deeper the better, the more measurements you have, the better, obviously. Um, the distance between each temperature probe must be known. You gotta know that distance. Um, it doesn't have to be constant exactly, but you must know that distance. Um, because that, that tells you that's how far the temperature changed between those two points. That's what you want to know. Um, absolute position is desirable. You want to know how, like if, you want to know how deep you are, but it's more important to know how far apart the temperature sensors are than, than actually how deep you are. Um, getting depth measurement requires energy. Yep, I mean, getting from the surface to a certain depth requires energy. How do you generate that energy? There's basically a few different ways to do it. There's three different ways to generate that energy. You can, there's something called the DLR mole. DLR stands for Deutsche Luft und Raumschaft, which is the, basically the German NASA. Um, the Germans designed this thing called the mole that's a miniature pile driver. We'll talk more about that if, you want, if you're interested. And it, um, it was designed for, the, for Mars. And uh, it's just, it's just slowly, very, very slowly digs a hole. Probably too, slowly for the, probably too slowly for Venus. You'll be dead by the time it gets anywhere. Um, a drill, everyone knows drills, um, but drills require a certain amount of mass to be on top. Otherwise, if you guys have drilled down and it kicks your hand back right, it takes a certain amount of mass and pressure, force to hold the drill from kicking your hand back. You guys only have five kilograms of mass. Most teams that want to dig a hole use a penetrator. That's kinetic energy, basically. You basically, it's just um, a missile that doesn't explode. It kind of like hits the ground and goes on the ground. But that's a very energetic, very, very, uh, um, chaotic very it's a it's a it's a lot of stuff happening at one time and it's like wow things just broke uh so um it's an energetic reaction so there's positives and negatives to each of these i'll let you read that if you're interested in it um, we can talk about it more but uh those are three basic ways to get to a depth if you want to measure temperature um or sorry uh heat flow or if, if you just want to get to a depth if you want to measure the uh if, if you want to look at um quakes on Venus as well. Thermocouples. Thermocouples are how you measure temperature. If you're measuring heat flow or if you're measuring putting up a temperature network, it doesn't matter. You're going to use a thermocouple. A thermocouple, as the name would suggest, thermo meaning temperature and couple meaning two. So a thermocouple, it's two dissimilar metals is the book definition. Basically, you've got two metals. It's, just think of it as a wire. It is as thin as a wire. That's as that's a thick one, okay? They're very thin, okay? And it's a wire basically made of two metals. And you guys know this, when a metal is heated or cooled, it expands or contracts, right? And so if you have two different metals and they're sandwiched together like this, and you know what they are, they've been calibrated, okay? And so you heat or you cool it, it's one side's gonna expand faster than the other, or contract or something like that. And so you're gonna have one of these things going on where it goes whoop, whoop, something like that, where one side expands or contracts faster than the other side. And that, that um, motion is gonna create a voltage. It induces a voltage in this wire because one side's moving more than the other side. It induces a voltage. That voltage is measured by a computer. And that computer can interpret that voltage to be 12 degrees or whatever you want it to be, right? So um, not whatever you want it to be, whatever it is. It's been calibrated essentially. So those voltages are calibrated. It's, they're really uh, fascinating. They're so simple, yet they're so, I mean, they're very elegant from an engineering standpoint. They're beautiful actually. They um, work great. They're very robust. It's a wire, okay? It's, you can beat it up. However, it is a touchy measurement. It has to actually touch what it's measuring. The heat has to touch it. The heat, the, 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 the temperature that it's measuring has to touch the thermocouple, which, which um, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change your design some. Uh, um, we're not talking about that yet, but just think about that later. So um, blah, 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 I've gone through these things. 
Um, very thin, very low mass. They don't require power, uh, thermocouples don't, but the computer that runs it requires power. So basically it's just a wire that sits there and if you heat it, it goes whoop, and then that, that induces a voltage, that voltage is measured by a computer. So they don't really require their own power um, because they induce their own voltage. They actually produce power a little bit, not much, then you couldn't power anything off of it. But so, if, so there's a table like at the end of this or in the next table you're gonna figure out, it's gonna ask for the power for certain instruments. Thermocouples don't require power. Um, for that matter, pressure transducers are very similar. Pressure transducer, it's a die, you know, just think it's a very, this is a very big pressure transducer, not that big. Think of it like a straw, okay? And um, there's a diaphragm inside that straw and uh, the, the straw is touching the atmosphere it's measuring and if it's, if it's a high pressure, it's get, the diaphragm gets pushed down. If it's a low pressure, the diaphragm is pulled up, right? So this diaphragm moves, boop, 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 makes that noise too, boop, boop. The, that, that diaphragm moves depending on the pressure of the outside atmosphere. And um, that motion of the diaphragm, again, it induces a voltage which is read by a computer. And so um, it's the same sort of, it's the same basic way that the thermocouple works. Um, so uh, again, it doesn't require uh, power necessarily. Sometimes you'll see very little trickle power that a thermocouple or that a th thermocouple or a pressure transducer might require just to excite it just a little bit. But, um, but the computer is what takes the most power, the computer that, it re that it's required to interpret the voltage that's, uh, that is output. So uh, pressure transducer, thermocouple, they, very, they work similarly in that respect. Um, so back to temperature and heat flow issues. They have to have good contact with what you're measuring. Temperature, if you measure temperature and heat, you have to have good contact with something. Like if I'm trying to measure the temperature of my forehead, if I go like this, just kind of hover about and don't touch, like touch my hair, you know, that's, that's going to give me a crappy measurement of the temperature of my forehead, right? So um, good contact. Now what does, it, what does good mean? That's up to whatever you guys interpret it. You want to have solid contact. You want to have as good as you can get contact with whatever you're measuring the temperature of. Um, again, like I said earlier, um, time and location saying it's 10 degrees tells us nothing, absolutely nothing. Uh, might as well not even take the measurement at all. You want to be able to tell us where it's 10 degrees and that's going to require an accelerometer, basically. You're going to have to have something that gives you positional data along with your temperature data or pressure data in order for that data to mean anything. You gotta have positional data. You gotta know where you are. Um, and if you're doing heat flow, you have to know the distance between those two temperature measurements very precisely for that temperature measurement to mean anything. Getting away again, landers, just like with, uh, you know, popping and snapping and crackling for, uh, for seismometer measurements, landers will produce heat. They make, make shadows, which would um, impact heat, stuff like that. So um, landers are not great. Uh, they're great because they get you there, but then you want to get away from them as fast as possible because they influence your measurements. Um, uh, so finding a thermocouple that fits your temperature measurement. Thermocouple is a lot like, um, I mean, they make them for different, if, if you took one of those, those this, I keep using this pointer, but if, um, uh, if you took one of those, those forehead temperature measurement things, and you tried to measure the temperature of your turkey in your oven, it's not gonna do a very good job because those things are designed to measure between you know, 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 120 degrees Fahrenheit because outside that range, you're dead. And so it's really precise measuring between those, that temperature band, but outside it, it's not very precise. So you wanna find a, a, a thermocouple that will measure what you expect to see. Um, and there's, there's some resources in the engineering design in the Inspires notebook that'll point you to how to you know find thermocouples and stuff like that but just just remember that, that that i mean there are some thermocouples that measure a wide range but they don't but they don't measure very precisely so they're going to measure like in big blocks there's some thermocouples that measure a really narrow range but they'll measure very precisely so you might want to do a combination of those if you're um not really sure what you're going to see but you have an idea of what the temperatures you might see. So you can combo those. Because again, thermocouples, it's a wire, almost no mass basically. So it's, it's again, it's a, it's a freebie almost. It's a great measurement. Um, thermal shorts, um, it's not like, it's not like, you know, cut off jeans or anything like that. Thermal shorts are um, just like, uh, in, 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 like an electrical short, when you like short something electrically, you put, you know, a wire between it and you short it out and MacGyver opens the door or something. But um, a thermal short basically is if you have a heat over here and 
something cold over here, if you were to put a metal rod between them, the metal rod would heat, would heat up and would transfer the heat between That's a thermal short. A thermal short is a lot like an electrical short. So basically, if you're measuring um, heat flow, you don't want to make your, your, uh, your rod, your, um, your projectile out of metal because it's going to become a constant temperature across the whole thing. You want to watch out for thermal shorts. Um, watch out for conducting heat from areas that you don't want to conduct it to areas, you know. So just pay attention to, to um, how you're, what you're measuring and what is around what you're measuring. If you're measuring temperature and your thermocouple is in the middle of a big chunk of metal, um, the big chunk of metal will also will affect the measurement of that, th of that thermocouple, that temperature. So um, be aware of that. That's a design thing we'll talk about later as we get closer to design stuff, but that's just wanted you to be cognizant of that and start thinking about it right now. Magnetic fields, all right, sweet, magnetic fields. Um, so it's a description of the magnetic influence um, electric, of uh, the electric currents and magnetic materials, blah, blah, blah. Um, usually it's used, it's, uh, they use B. I don't know why they use B. Tell me why they use B. Someone tell me why they use B. It's called a B field. It's got a vector symbol on top, the arrow. Um, produced by moving electric charges and the intrinsic magnetic uh, moments of, uh, of elementary particles. So, you know, it's got ferrous materials or the earth has a magnetic field because we have a very large spinning conductor, right? And you have a large spinning conductor, it's gonna create a magnetic field. Um, our, our, our large spinning conductor is our spinning magma core. It's a very hot conductive core that's spinning and that spinning, that, that motion of that conductor, that motion of those, um, electric charges that creates a magnetic field and ours is very large fortunately for us because we're you know that helps us to stay alive um helps our compasses work too um measuring magnetic fields typically you'll use what's called the magnetometer and most magnetometers that, sh that we use in spacecraft are called flux gate magnetometers it's the most popular by far this is a picture of a flux gate right here they're lightweight they are very robust they are awesome um they are totes my goats, definitely. So um, the bad thing about a magnetometer is, is it, it's, it's, it doesn't discriminate. It measures all magnetic fields. Um, so a magnetometer, um, if, 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 if I were to put a magnetometer, if, if, if I were to have one up here, it would measure great. It would be measuring magnetic fields over here. It would be like sweet magnetic fields. But as I get it closer to this television, it's going to start measuring the magnetic field from this TV. It's going to start measuring the magnetic field from the computer down here. So uh, mag magnetic uh, ma magnetometers like to be isolated. They're very antisocial instruments. They don't want to be near other instruments. They don't want to be near computers. They don't want to be near processors. They don't want to be near metals. They want to be away from things. On spacecraft, um, when we have when when we have a magnetometer on a spacecraft, we put them on a 10 meter boom that we extend out. Like, there's a, a boom is like a long rod or a long arm basically from the spacecraft. We put them on a 10 meter boom and we always have two of them on spacecraft. We have one at the end of the boom and then one at the very base of the boom. So this one measures magnetic fields down here and then the one on the 10 meter out, it measures magnetic fields out there. And so this one's sort of our control group, the one at the base of the boom. Um, so as a general rule, you wanna be as far away from uh, things that create magnetic fields as possible if you're measuring magnetic fields. So that would include uh, processors, that would include communication devices, that would include antennas, um, even some metals that would interfere with the magnetic field measurement. You want to be away from those things. Uh, that's the bad part about magnetic field, about flux gate magnetometers. Otherwise, they're awesome. They're light, they do great, they're robust. You can knock them around and they'll survive. There's not much to it. Basically, it's two coils sitting next to each other. And um, one coil is small and it's sitting there, it's just listening. It's like the listening coil. One coil is is excited. It's like, whoo, it's excited. And um, basically excited just means it's a, it's a solenoid. Basically, it's a coil like this. And so basically what happens is they excite that coil with some um, a voltage. They put, they, they, put, they put electricity through it. And so that creates a magnetic field, which, which this guy senses. So this guy, this little sensor coil over here, it's just sitting there and it says, okay, I feel the magnetic field from this guy. And then when this when this guy senses another magnetic field, this magnetic field is perturbed, it changes. And this little sensor coil senses that change. Um, it's, a, it's a complicated math and stuff like that, but it's basically how it works. There's two coils next to each other. 
uh, two, two, two solenoid coils next to each other. One of them is uh, excited with the voltage. One of them is just sitting there listening, and um, that's it. So uh, very robust, very. Uh, but they like to be isolated. They're very antisocial. So just remember that if you're looking at magnetic field. And again, on Venus, scientists do not believe there is one. Um, if there is one, they think it's very weak. So that might be an interesting measurement to do, to, measure, to try to measure magnetic field at the surface or something like that. So what's next? Um, your team is gonna choose your science objective or objectives. Um, what are you interested in, basically? What, um, but, I mean, besides the fact these, these videos have been long and stuff, what has interest you about Venus? Again, there's outside Venus, there's the interaction of the magnetic, of the solar winds with Venus. There's the atmosphere of Venus, which all sorts of junk happens. In the, there's lightning. There's sulfur, there's or, or, sorry, sulfuric acid rain, there's hurricanes, there's, uh, what else? There might be life, it's a really thick atmosphere, strong winds, everything going on. There's the surface of Venus. On the surface, again, there's, you can look at, uh, it's just really high temperature, um, high pressure areas. And so you can look at the, you can determine the composition of the materials, you know, what are the, you know, has, is there any carbon left in the rocks on Venus or has it all escaped out into the atmosphere? That type of thing, you can look at that. Um, or you can try to look at the internal structure of the planet of Venus. That's a, that's a very difficult thing to do, but you can try to do that if you want. So what has interest you about Venus so far? Or go completely off menu. We had several teams do that last semester, just come up with their own science objectives, and it was awesome. They did a great job. Some of the best teams came up with their own science objectives that we I'd never even heard of until they told us about it. So I, I encourage you to do your own research on Venus and look into that on your own. Um, there's some really cool stuff that we haven't touched on in, this, in these uh, videos. Uh, you want to research, so you, I mean, you want to think about what interests you and then start narrowing it down. Start trying to figure out, whittle it down. Don't, don't want to be too big. You want to start whittling it down. Uh, look at the environmental conditions around Venus. Start looking at Venus in general. Uh, that, that'll, you know, that'll be a good idea. But especially around whatever you're interested in. If you're looking at the atmosphere, what, where in the atmosphere, what are the conditions like in the atmosphere. If you look at the surface, start, start looking more in more detail about the environmental conditions of the surface, that type of thing. Start thinking about the instruments you would need. Um, are you going to measure temperature or pressure? You're going to need an accelerometer, so start looking at that already. Uh, if you're going to measure um, composition, start looking at mass spectrometers. Uh, start thinking about how you're actually going to accomplish your science objective. What instruments you're going to need to accomplish your science objective. And then start filling out the science traceability matrix. And that is, there's, there's an example in your engineering design notebook about the science traceability matrix, and there's one right here as well. So the science trace matrix, the science trace matrix starts on the very left hand side with, is that left? Yeah, left hand side with science objective. What is your science objective? Your overall overarching, your science question, if you will. What is it? And then what is your measurement objective? Okay, there, uh, the science, like, you know, this is the what do you want to look at? This is how are you going to actually, you know, what are you actually going to use to measure? What are you actually measuring in this thing? Um, the measurement requirements, uh, you know, how often you want to measure, are there certain altitudes you want to measure, are there certain times, or, uh, you know, is there a timing thing involved? What about, what about your science objective is going to constrain your measurement? Um, what do we need to know in order to measure, in order to take that measurement? Uh, and then lastly, what are the instruments you're going to use? So there's an example on this thing that I used. Um, if you wanted to, because it's a, it's, a, it's a good one for this. If your science objective is to determine the internal structure of Venus, what is the internal structure of Venus? Internal structure. What are you actually measuring with internal structure? You're not going to measure, there, there's no such thing as an internal structometer, okay? There's, you're not. And you're not, you're, not, you're not actually measuring internal structure. To, to determine internal structure, you're actually measuring vibrations. You're measuring quakes or vibrations. Now you could measure quakes or you could just have something hit the surface and create a vibration of your own, right? You can measure that. You're, so you're essentially you're measuring vibrations. Measurement requirements, these are stuff I made up for the purpose of this example right here. We're going to use, uh, you're going to have to have at least three probes. We know we have to have at least three probes because we have to have a, um, a network. We're going to stay on the surface. We're going to have at least a, a four hour lifetime because 
five hours and the probe is dead anyway, so we've got to get the data back after that. And we're going to measure continuously. So we're not going to turn them off. We're going to measure, going to turn them on and keep measuring for that entire four hours. Um, we're not going to turn them off and on, basically. What are we going to use for the measurement? We're using accelerometer. So um, just to give you all a heads up, you can have, <clears throat> for one science uh, objective, you can have multiple things over here. So don't let the rows fool you, okay? You can have multiple things going down your row that go back to one science objective, okay? So if, you're, if your science objective is looking for life on Venus, then you, you know, looking for life on Venus. Um, is there life on Venus? And then what are you actually measuring? You're gonna measure a lot of stuff for that. You're gonna measure temperatures and pressures. You're gonna measure uh, you know, properties and composition, essentially. What are the compositions? And then what are you looking at? What are the exact compositions? What are the exact elements you're looking for? That's gonna be your requirements here. What are you looking for? Amino acids, probably, if you're looking for a life. But what is an amino acid? I have no idea, I'll be honest with you. I'm not a biology person or a chemistry person for that matter. And then what are you gonna use for those measurements for temperature and pressure? You're gonna use a thermocouple and you're gonna use, acceler and you're gonna use a, um, a pressure transducer. For location, you're gonna use an accelerometer because you have to know where you are if you, if you find life, right? Um, and then you're gonna use a mass spectrometer. But um, for the, uh, uh, for the, uh, uh, the um, composition measurements. So, um, sorry, brain fart. And so this is just an example, that what, what I said was just an example also. So don't let the rows fool you. You can have one science objective and then multiple things over here, multiple things going down over here. Um, but we want you to fill this in. Look in the engineering design notebook. There's a, there's a more detailed explanation in the engineering design notebook, the Inspires notebook, in this section that talks about the science traceability matrix. Look at that. There's the, basically there's the who, what, when, where, how, why. There's the, um, the five W's or the whatever, how many W's there are. I don't know how many W's there are. But um, it kind of explains what you put in each of these categories. And we'll talk about this in person as well. This is, this is one of the big things you want to do. This is one of the first things we have to do. And it's probably one of the hardest things you do because it is the first thing you do. And it's so weird. Uh, but you want to get this done. You want to nail this down because this, everything builds from this. Once you get this nailed down, you find your instruments and you can fill your instrument table out boom it's it's go time from there so this is some of the hardest stuff we do but you guys can do this um, if you have any questions talk to us in person send us an email whatever you want to do um, but aside from that good luck and let us know if you have any questions uh, thanks a lot bye bye